We drove away from the doctor's office, me in the back seat, nine or so, my parents in the front. They were mostly silent. We'd just come from the allergist's office, where we'd gotten my results from the dreaded scratch test. That's the ruthless procedure where your back gets pricked full of holes and different essences of allergens are swabbed onto them. And then everyone plays the waiting game to see which parts of your back swell up, turn pink, itch, or otherwise show outward signs of your body's attempt to reject what it doesn't like. In the front seat of the car, my mom did make the occasional outburst. I was mostly confused and worried, two of my traits that plague me to this day. Mom veered wildly between rebuking everything the doctor had said or leaning into his instructions with ferocious care. She spoke whatever suited her passing thoughts, one of her traits that plagues her to this day. I don't care what he says, that's ridiculous, she huffed. And then a few minutes later, well, that's it. We're going to have to change what you do around the house. Whatever she said, my dad would agree with a, that's exactly right. <laughs> or a, gee whiz, you're telling me. <laughs> his agreeableness is one of his traits that plagues him to this day. <laughs> my mom was a nurse and my dad was a doctor. After years of my recurring bronchitis, itchy eyes, and other allergy symptoms, they finally caved when they realized they could not fix me themselves with Benadryl and took me to a specialist. They were not prepared for the results. I now had to take daily pills, use an inhaler, and get weekly shots. I was allergic to a lot of things. Some were just from the North Carolina forest where we lived. But the biggest reaction I had was to dust. Good old household, run-of-the-mill dust. The kind you polish your furniture, wipe your mantle, or sweep your floors to get rid of. The allergist was shocked, shocked, to report that I had the worst, most extreme allergy to dust he had ever seen. So the rest of our appointment was occupied with learning all about dust and how to treat our house for it. <laughs> the doctor's presentation was like anti-drug propaganda meant to scare the shit out of people. Except this propaganda worked. Did you know that dust contains dead skin cells? It's almost 50% dead skin cells. Did you know that dust also contains mites, which are tiny parasites that feed off all of those dead skin cells? Did you know that dust mites can live on your face? He sent us away with an additional prescription for a new lifestyle, instilling in me a fear of what I could not see. My parents were to pull up the carpeting from my room, remove the curtains and the blinds, put protective plastic coverings on the bed and on my pillow. Only one pillow on the bed from now on. I was to clear away stuffed animals from the bed, shelves, anywhere near me, get rid of items that were for decoration only. They just collect dust. Wash all bedding every three days, except for the pillowcase. That should be changed daily, along with the one pillow itself being laundered, because dust mites especially love pillows and pillowcases. I was not to do any household cleaning that involved stirring up dust, like vacuuming, sweeping, or, of course, dusting. <laughs> now, that last bit, I admit, I was pretty happy about. And I kind of used the allergy to my advantage at chore time. I can't, my dust allergy, I remember. And I still do that, actually. But the rest of the instructions stunned me. I knew about the boy in the plastic bubble. Those of us who hadn't watched the TV movie had at least seen the real kid on the news. I dreaded becoming that. Maybe allergies would incapacitate me for the rest of my life. Would I lose all my friends and watch them play in the streets from the other side of the window glass? Maybe I would die young and alone. My mom landed on the side of incaution. She wasn't about to pull up her fine-ass shag carpeting. She did not want to indulge in extra laundry, nor was she going to watch her daughter live a life with less allergy activity, but what would probably be considered a miserable lifestyle for a kid. 
So for better or worse, we adjusted the allergist rules for home life at about 50%. I still got those atrocious bed coverings that made even the slightest of body movements sound like a 90 decibel spasm of glossy junk mail. <laughs> I got put onto no dust chores, like making my parents their afternoon martinis. <laughs> While the other kids talked about the latest toy obsession, I was bragging about the difference between a Gibson and a Gimlet and ingratiating myself to the teachers. <laughs> Mrs. Middleton, look. If you order your martinis clean, neat, and Sahara dry, you might as well be advertising that you're a barely functioning alcoholic. <laughs> you gotta at least ask for a twist and a spray of vermouth, okay? Do me that favor. So I had a hobby, and my parents got something out of this new lifestyle. Even though the changes were nowhere near everything the doctor ordered, they were still enough to make me feel abnormal and worried. I began to focus on what could go wrong. I kept thinking about information the allergist had shared. In case you didn't know this, a person is not allergic to the mite itself. What you're actually allergic to is the mite's digestive juices, which it shits out after consuming the cells off of your face. <laughs> and then you inhale that juicy defecation and have an allergic reaction to it. Yeah, live with that. It became obvious to me. It didn't matter how much we washed my bedding or how often my mom pledged the furniture. I still saw dust using the streams of sunlight stabbing through our house's windows as a dance floor. No amount of cleaning or precautions could ever rid my room, our house, and certainly anything beyond our front door of dust mites. I started ruminating about mites and other microscopic organisms in general. The allergy medicines helped, but maybe there were other things out there that I didn't know about. What else can't I see that's also eating my face? <laughs> the number of things I ultimately had no control over seemed infinite. I didn't have much luck trying to broach this distressing topic with my parents. Trying to discuss anything medical with them was always a bad idea. They didn't have much sympathy for cuts and scrapes, often responding to my tears with scoffs and a, that's what you were screaming about? <laughs> or, well, you should have seen the guy that came into the ER one time. After his motorcycle crashed, he had almost all the skin hanging off his arm from where he dragged on the pavement. So inevitably, every time I'd ask about mites, bacteria, or germs, my parents' answers were always along the lines of, you can't do anything about it. There's millions of germs and bacteria all over you every day. And you just have to live with it, so get over it. Rather than getting over it, I became a compulsive hand washer. Because surely everything I touched was disgusting. Ultra hot water, extra scrubbing. My hands were dry, chapped, cracked, and little dots of blood would often pop up on them. But I was stripping my skin of anything gross living on it, I felt. My mom made me sleep wearing gloves full of Vaseline. The dryness was a new problem to fix. I eventually outgrew many of my allergies or moved away from them, but my compulsive behaviors didn't stop. Over the years, they just transformed into different ones, new stress reactions to things I couldn't control. I was dumped by a boyfriend, and I would lie awake at night wondering if there was anything I could do to fix the breakup. I thought about what I could change, how I could show him I've changed. Maybe I could take up skateboarding, and then we could skate together. I could try that. But maybe he'll never want to get back together. How long before he's with someone else? Someone who prefers pour over coffee. I can't pretend to care, I hate coffee. <laughs> maybe he has been with someone else, and I'll just never know. I began wagging my feet back and forth as I tried to sleep and couldn't, as if this behavior would either distract me from or absorb the energy from the thoughts, the worries, the nagging self-jabs that were preventing rest. Wagging my feet didn't work any better as a soother than washing my hands did years earlier, but that didn't stop me from doing it. When I first moved to San Diego from Los Angeles, I was going through what my southern upbringing of denial, euphemisms, and suppression still dictates I refer to as a little bit of gravel in the road. <laughs> I was jobless, I had lost my apartment, 
and had to move in with my then boyfriend here. And not one, but both of my dogs had died within the previous eight months. I had, don't make me cry. <laughs> uh, I had hit a low I didn't think was possible. I couldn't stop thinking about how I ended up where I was, about everything that had happened, all the ways I screwed up, things I could have done better. Everything in life had taken a shit on my face and I was inhaling all the juices and there were no shots to take, no plastic coverings that could help. I couldn't wash it, I couldn't foot wag it away. All I could do was think and I was paralyzed by it. Eventually I did what every red-blooded human being should do. I dumped my problems onto a therapist. An incredibly kind, unbelievably patient saint of a therapist. She listened, she guided me to introspection and all that good therapy stuff, but as time passed in the city that I considered just a pit stop, my desire, my yearning, my crushing need to get my life sorted out and all unknowns answered and all steps plotted did not improve. Every idea that my therapist and I had for tackling my issues ended up a spectacular backfire. One day following my therapist's advice of taking morning walks in an effort to foster more presence in the moment, I was counting steps out of boredom in between sidewalk breaks, and then I began to make sure I was keeping things even for my feet. If the left foot stepped on a crack, the right foot had to step on the next crack. Seems logical. <laughs> Rather than a grounding exercise, a morning walk became a new controlling morning habit that only added to anxiety. Alone in the shower, with nothing to do but think of every possible scenario of conflict and things I could say and do in case such imagined scenarios arise in the near or distant future. A new therapy plan. Have some fun. Get some of those bath crayons to try to turn that shower back into relaxing me time. Just let loose and get creative. Crayons in hand, standing in the shower. I couldn't think of a single thing to draw. What do people draw? I could only relive losing my job and things I should have said over and over. And on the shower walls, I instead made color-coded lists of what I needed to do <laughs> in what subjects and how to get back on track. <laughs> we attempted to put me on a schedule to give me regularity and a sense of having power over something in my life, which led to me having panicked meltdowns upon realizing that I did not account for lunchtime, bathroom breaks, or phone calls. I spiraled, disintegrating into calculations of five minutes here and possible scenarios there, finally comprehending that the practice was actually harmful. North Carolina or California, dust or adulthood, regardless of the place and the fears, I ended up a kid in her own bubble after all. I don't have the stereotypical behaviors often attributed to someone who's diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. I don't check burners or the door locks endlessly. I don't need to perform a ritual a certain number of times, except I do have to kiss my cats exactly eight times on the head each. <laughs> but many of my actions, unnoticed, I hope, are driven by compulsion, obsession, rumination, perseverance, and ultimately anxiety. I do understand now how early it starts. As a very young child, I just knew that my parents were going to get in a horrific car wreck and die every time they left the house. I was also a collector of objets d'art that I deemed important or of emotional significance, like precious juice boxes or rare, interesting sticks that I would nest away in the corner of my closet. <laughs> These behaviors of mine, unbeknownst to my parents and me, were symptoms of OCD. Now the allergies from my childhood are mainly gone. I'm still allergic to cats, but it's worth it. <laughs> I'm still on medications for the allergies and the OCD. I still see a therapist and I still wriggle my damn feet. I try to curb anxiety though and prevent it from manifesting as OCD instead of allow anxiety to grow into habits that will become yet another thing to worry about or insult myself over. A few years ago, a friend of mine showed me her new tattoo. On the inside of her wrist, it read, surrender. She was so proud of it, and her face beaming, she told me it was a reminder of all she'd been through. She said she'd fi she finally realized that she couldn't control everything, 
And so she decided she's just got to surrender to where life takes her and just know that she'll be okay. I thought that was the stupidest fucking tattoo I'd ever seen. <laughs> I could not believe she paid hundreds of dollars to have a shallow beach house nothing word etched into her. <laughs> I found the very concept behind it nonsensical and even irritating. And if you're going to pay to have your flesh pricked with a needle, it better be for good reason, like your health. <laughs> but a few years later, seeing how the seeds of OCD, which stem from anxiety, existed very early on, knowing that the seeds were inadvertently fostered by a doctor who just wanted to help, who just wanted to make sure I understood what was going on in order to make my health better and ended up making it worse, well, that irony just hit. One day, maybe I was trying to take a pleasant walk or shower, the irony hit me so hard that I actually had the thought, oh, now that tattoo makes sense. I totally get why she had that done. I try to be more like my mom. That might be the only time I'll ever say that. I try to be more like my mom and be okay with modifying a plan, even halfway. Maybe complete surrender isn't in the cards for me yet, but at least ruminating on it is. Thank you. Jennifer Corley, everyone. Jennifer Corley.